I'll do the two demos I was going to show uh, <laughs> on the last lecture, right? The first one is to see streaming videos. I mean, you've probably seen uh, stuff like YouTube and stuff like that. And um, this is the class of applications where you connect some device to your TV and then you can watch your TV anywhere on the internet, right? And it kind of shows you with some of the artifacts that you would see um, on. So this is from a high definition feed from my home and it's coming to the reverse DSL. So if you look at DSL, DSL has a much higher bandwidth to going in, but less to come up, right? So I'm trying to go into my home and pull out the video. And you would see the quality is not as good as what you expect. Um, but over here, it'll show you how much bandwidth I'm getting. And you'll see that it kind of changes with the, the kind of scene. I don't want to go green yet. But. OK, so we have Dish at home. So I can control the thing here. So I'm just going to turn it off so I can um, see what's going on. So um, I guess get cold. Um, <laughs> but this is the, the, the bandwidth that I'm using. You can kind of see that it keeps changing a little bit. You know, so um, I think I'm supposed to be 512 kbps or something, right? And if you watch closely, depending on what scene is coming on, it may look acceptable and not acceptable, right? So when you're seeing the without the person, it would have been acceptable because of the, uh, and, and we'll see what, what, why, but essentially these characters, and since they're not moving as much, there's less data to, to transmit while you still get good quality, right? I mean, you may be look into MPEG and all those things, you would understand why that is so, right? And if you look at her, she would look kind of awful because she's moving a lot, and that means there's less redundancy, that means I need more network bandwidth, and if I don't get enough bandwidth, either you see that she's not moving, she moves uh, in a jerky fashion. So I'm, I'm gonna try to go to some other channel, um, which, this is sort of a, so, that's not worry about what the show is. Um, But this is sort of what you begin to get because network kind of is going back, right? What we're really worried about, interested is to make it such that you can still get something out of the deal. I mean, they're, they're doing all they can to give you good uh, stuff. Um, and you'll see lots of artifacts, which we'll see what they, what they are, um, in fashions that, I'm not sure if I want to see this. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, uh, we use Dish and it's all Snowden, so all I have is the local channel, right? Um, okay, so, yeah, this, this should be okay, right? <laughs> but you would see that, you know, so you will notice that this is, this is not, this is different from the previous one, right? This is a cartoon, so it has certain color artifacts. Um, it's written a certain way because it does not much shade, you know, it's um, the kid is of the same color, the cat is all gray, and that has implications on how we go about uh, the compression, right? Um, and I'm looking for some program which I'm looking for a human being in a normal kind of TV, right? And it's, um, okay, like something like this, right? So if so, these things would be suited for. I mean, they're designed for TV programs like this because that's what people are expected to see a lot, right? And you would notice that when things are bad, people are moving slowly, right? But you would you would you would begin to see that there are, um, there are certain ways the quality kind of falls off, and the course is trying to figure out. So at the end of the course, you should be able to kind of look at this stuff and say, okay, this is what is happening. There's too much motion here. The motion vectors are, are killing the network. And how do you make, make them 
which is tolerable, right? Um, you may disagree there whether this is tolerable, but this is it's still far right from what a true high definition feed would be, right? So when I'm at home, this 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 um, this particular device can use up to eight megabits per second, right? So I'm only giving it like about 500 kbps or something, and it's still able to give you something. Um, though, would you consider this to be uh, a useful sort of? Can you watch TV with, with this kind of quality? It's also hard to <laughs> yeah, the audio is not that useful because you can barely hear it. So anyway, so if it's not useful to you, right, there's not a whole lot we can do here because I can't upgrade my home DSL to anything faster, right? But so a lot of scenarios, this is all you get, and and, and uh, how how do you get some good quality? This is the main concern. Um, so I'm going to kind of stop this. Hey, don't worry if you don't see all the nuances. But I'm saying, you know, this is sort of what what we are um, interested in. Uh, stuff. The other one I was showing, uh, I was going to show was the the DVD. Many of you use DVDs, but you may not have authored a DVD, so you may not have seen the sort of free structure that they have. So when you, unfortunately, the, the some of the videos didn't show up. But when you see when you authoring a DVD, you typically tend to have these buttons, and you know, when you see movies, you have buttons and things moving in the background and all those things, each of them are added as multimedia objects. Right? So if you see, um, let's say if you play this video, there may be components missing. So if I try to see how this will look like, this is sort of, this is, you know, this is using iMovie and, and it, it, it comes with this um, little thing, right? But essentially all the, all the stuff you're seeing are, are video objects. Right, all the little, you know, the the sun and then things moving and stuff, and you are have to describe what happens. You are sort of describing that the sun kind of sun or whatever the thing is moving this way. Right? When, you, when you notice it came kind of from the kind of took a turn, right? Um, and you you have to program what happens. So you have to program what happens if I move it up here and I click this and. Um, this showed up, so I have a slideshow going on here, and if I go to the yeah, so so all these animations and and how these things interact would have to be specified by the the DVD uh, developer, right? And I think the video, yeah, the video is not there. Um, so if you look at the structure. You may notice that it, it kills the machine because all these things are. Sorry, it's um, not being fast. So this is sort of what what um, I was talking about, right? So you you kind of have the um, the hierarchical structure. So when when it, when if I made this into a DVD, the first object would be this, right? And then it goes from here, and you can drill down and say what event takes you somewhere, right? So when you're watching a movie, you go through this different uh, different path, right? So when you buy a, buy a typical movie, you may have seen like in a director's cut, or uh, the white screen and uh, regular movie and different audios and stuff, and all of them have to be other like this, right? So the finished product looks fairly good. I mean, it's good enough for you to even play little games on the stuff, but somebody has to create all, the, all, all this authoring. Uh, if the authoring here is a little bit more tricky than if you do the HTML kind of stuff because you have to have the timing right. So if you don't have the timing right, if you don't have certain uh, options, um, because these are these are rich media, right? And, and, and um, so our goal is to see how you know whether you can uh, use some of these features, whether we know that if something is going to happen, what we can achieve and stuff. Right? So these are two kind of um, demos that this sort of work, but you know, hopefully give you a sense of the challenges, right? So I'm going to go back to the PC. So that's where I was supposed to leave off in, in the last lecture. Um, 
So multimedia is a fairly rich um, area of study, right? It, it includes all kind of stuff. In, in fact, I would argue that anything you studied would be uh, sort of applicable in, in this sense because it, it adds certain other features, right? Um, so we have to worry about um, the kind of applications and for solving the application, how you specify, how, how do you author them, how do you um, compress them, and how do you play them, and, and um, the tools and interfaces and all those things, right? Um, how many of you, let's just take one multimedia system, right? How many of you use YouTube? In, in what capacity? Just watching videos or have you uploaded something to YouTube or have you added annotation or all, all those things? So I'm going to actually give a homework assignment one, uh, homework project one, which kind of covers that, right? So I want you to be able to upload the stuff, not because it's, it's stock assignment or something, but it's, it's, it's good to see the, the whole process, right? Um, so in terms of using YouTube, right, which is a good example, right? How do you find out, how do you find new objects, video objects? That's that's an excellent application, right? You search. I mean, there's there's one motion where you're just sitting idly and then just go to the web page and then start going to letter whatever it gives you, right? But searching, right? Um, so searching, how would you how do you search for YouTube videos? You said presidential debate, which is you know I'm guessing you type presidential debates, right? How else would you do you search? How else would you like to search? How how else do you like to find? Yeah, so taking beyond that, right? So, so yeah, related video is something that YouTube would tell you, right? So if you look at some video, it says this is related, right? You want to guess how would, how they find out if something is related? I don't know the actual algorithm that YouTube uses, but how would you find out if two videos are related? Yeah. Look at the tags that oh, the, the uploader puts on each clip. Yeah, so tags, right? Textual tags. You, you can say what this, this video is about. So you can say this is presidential debate, and then anything which is related to that, is, you can do that, right? So going beyond that, what else would you like to see as related? Yeah. I think they um, search the video descriptions for like similar words too, mm -hmm. not just the text. Yeah, so yeah, you can, you can have the textual search on the video object to find out from the description, right? Yeah. I don't know if YouTube does this, but you can see if someone watched one video and then mm -hmm. they watched another one. Yeah, so if they're, if they're one, you know, one is you know, they co popular kind of stuff, right? So one, one is popular, and then people are watching one after the other, then they're related, right? Going beyond all those textual kind of textual and, and, and like link kind of stuff, right? Think of in a video kind of format. How would you look for something which is related? Right? How would you search for something? How would you search for something like, I want a picture of a snow where I sort of want the, the sky to be sort of bluish. I want the, the, you know, being able to specify how it looks, right? So right now I can search for snow, right? Let's say I want, uh, for some reason I want to show how snow is, I want to take a picture of snow. So if I search for snow, what kind of objects do you expect I would get? Obviously the, 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 the regular snow, right, the, the snow. But how do you specify, how do you, go beyond that and specify stuff in a visual format because you know video is visual, right? So I, I don't just want picture any picture of snow, I want a picture of some snow in a certain fashion, right? The 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 trivial example is is the using the tags, right? I mean tags get you so far, but going beyond that, being able to specify how the video looks like. So I want to I want a picture of a snow with a certain view and I want a picture of a snow, I want a picture of like a hash massive thing. Um, and those kind of techniques is 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 um, there's a lot of research on that one. You're trying to figure out how to query, how to get it back. Uh, the first step would be the textual stuff, right? And there are a lot of reasons to believe that textual stuff, you know, gets you only so far, right? Presidential debates, 
tend to be you know what you expect the tags are good but in regular in, in, in typical way you know giving tags is not very useful and there's a lot of research which shows that adding a good tag is very hard because you want the tag to say everything about the theme and that, that's not really possible right uh, so if you're looking for a place uh, or looking for for something you're not just looking for a place you're looking for something else right you would you would have, you would have figured it if you're searching for something to watch if you're uh, especially uh, like me when I have a when I have a kid, I want to show him something about trains, right? So if you search for trains, you usually find stuff that you don't want. I want to be able to say I want some kind of cold train and stuff, and you're looking for textual stuff, and you want to do the stuff, right? And that is another big area of research. Um, we'll kind of briefly cover. So, so in terms of stuff, you know, there's a notion of production, there's a notion of how to compress them, there's a notion of how to deliver them, and the systems issue of how to make sure that computers can um, can deliver them to your computers, can send, deliver them all the network, how it could be stored and all those things. And the issue of what can you do with them beyond just delivering them, how to search them and all those things are, are, are the area of topic. So if you look at the, the top conference in multimedia, this is ASA multimedia, they have different tracks. And essentially the, the different tracks are content, coding, and systems kind of stuff, right? So in this course, I'm gonna focus on the systems aspects. Right? I'm gonna talk about how, what it means for computer scientists um, we are going to focus on how to analyze the, the video, how to do the searching, all those things. Even though technologies here would be worth billions, right? Essentially, YouTube would, would become a lot more powerful if I can give you a related video, not just based on tags, but, but based on how it looks, based on something beyond just the textual information, right? Um, but we are not going to do that because we just don't have time to see them. The, this whole field is, is it's, it's very beyond what the current modern thing comes. But the unfortunate event is I cannot talk about this, the, 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 how it means to networks and operating systems kind of stuff without you having some understanding of how the, how, what, what it means to be a video, what it means to compress all those things. So for the first, about the third, I'm going to use the Lee and Drew book, textbook, to show how compression works on all those things because then you can understand when you saw the video, when you saw the uh, little TV thing, you understand what is really going on and how, how we can uh, achieve this stuff. Right? So, like I mentioned, that particular video requires like about eight megabits per second. And if you don't have eight megabits per second, I need to do something, I need to draft something. What do I draft such that I still get some good good uh, uh, usage out of it? It's what what we're interested in. And, and, and that's what that's, that's, the, that's the reason why we're gonna go through and talk about um, video, pictures, audios, and all those, all those stuff, right? So. Does that make sense? So unfortunately, that means that we need to use two textbooks in the class. I try to avoid two textbooks because you know, textbooks tend to be fairly expensive. But in this case, um, the, the multimedia systems textbook sort of assumes that you know what video is, sort of assumes what, what you're talking about. And, the, and the, you know, I could find one book which covers both of them. Um, to be honest, both of the books are not exactly the best books, but these are the, the ones that are in the market. So the field is still new, and there's, there's need for more books. So, um, I'll, I'll try to add more, more stuff along the way to make them more useful. Right? So we'll we'll cover most from the textbook, and then I'll I'll try to give you something on what is what is happening in the um, research community. Um, but we need to understand the basics so we can understand what what's what's going on. Right? So the logistics I was supposed to finish as, uh, yesterday. But essentially, we'll have uh, eight eight homework assignments. Sorry, seven homework assignments every two weeks. Um, mostly from the textbook. Mostly to make sure that you are you are following the textbook, we have two homework projects, groups of two, um, and they're, they're not programming projects. I'm not, uh, one of the things you realize is programming any of this stuff and getting the timing right is way beyond the scope of what you can do in this particular class. So this is more of how to kind of experience what we're talking about in the, in the class. So the first project I'm, I'm trying to get you to upload something to YouTube and then measure something on the network to see uh, uh, how the performance behaves. Um, we have homework in, in the midterm and the final. Um, so 
there's minimal programming uh, aspects of it, but groups of two, mostly for logistic purposes, you know, can't crack, it's harder to grade. I think there are 17 students in the class, so I would rather uh, reduce the number of students, right? There are a few graduate students, um, and for the graduate students, it's okay to work as individual project, group project is it's fine. And I have the, sorry, the homework assignment and the handout printout here, you can pick it up either after class or uh, whatever, right? Every class I try to print, print the lecture so you don't have to write, take it down, right? Um, so the projects would be a uh, group of two. Um, I would, I would, I would only look at a report, I don't look at your code or whatever you've done to get the results. So um, basically look at the report to see what, what you learned from the class. Um, and in general, any class I teach, I like for you to do to, to get the maximum freedom to look at something. So even though I define certain project, if you want to try something else, feel, feel free to talk to me and we can work, work something out. Uh, my goal is not for you to do the project I, I'm assigning you. My, my goal is for you to experience some of these things because my my biggest uh, feeling is most of the stuff, you, you know, if you, if you, you can either use the computers to do boring stuff or research stuff kind of thing, you know, like compute, Python, degree or something. But for the most of the other purposes, uh, any computer you're going to use is going to be about uh, video and audio and stuff because um, apparently that's what we do because you know the, the, the market for all these technologies are pretty high. So I want you. To, so if there's something you want to look at this, if you want to know how network games work, um, then that's excellent, right? So the the reverse policy if you have taken a course with me before, you can sort of know what the deal is. If it's a partial credit, then um, you know, so you have to give me some proof of why it's a part, why you should deserve better grade because it's related to the other people in the class. So um, I have some football practical, but that's you know, I, you should don't follow it, right? So essentially, what I mean is, if you if you get half the points because your answer is half right, and if you want to argue that you deserve seventy percent, right? So I give fifty percent related to the rest of the class. So you need to give me a reason why you deserve more points. If it's if you got it right and I didn't give you credit you should definitely talk to me. But if it's partial credit, you have to do some work and, and show to me why you deserve more points, right? It's also in the, in the uh, uh, class book. And the lateness policy, yeah, uh, you have to submit it before the beginning of the class. There's, there's no uh, late policy, right? If it's not contemplated regarding unforeseen emergencies, right? Uh, having to go to somebody's wedding is not unforeseen emergency because you should know, right? I've had that uh, before, right? So, in all the stuff, I want the homework assignment to be done by you, but I still want, but collaboration still is a, is a good thing, right? So I want to strike a balance between collaboration and uh, you doing individual work. I want you to learn, but on the other hand, learning also happens when you collaborate with others. So one of the, one of the rule is, even if I say it's individual effort, it's okay for you to collaborate, it's okay for you to work with somebody else, as long as you follow certain rules, right? The main rule is I want you to make sure that you learn, and the and you, you have to tell me who the collaborators are, right? And the 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 policy of that who giving citations to who you work with or where you got the content goes beyond the course, right? That's the professional ethical issue. If you if it's not your own idea, it's okay for you to learn it then as a presenter, just not as your own idea. So if you if you work with a bunch of people and somebody gave the idea or or what have you, mention all the people who we, who we collaborate with, so I know that you guys. We talk to each other. So the <coughs> other one, you've probably seen this, many of you may have seen this before, which is the Gilligan Silence rule, which is if you want to collaborate, collaborate with, with, uh, with each other, find the answers to the question, don't take down notes, just remember whatever you learned, and then go off, do something, and then write stuff on your own, right? If you do this, then the answers may be similar, but not exactly the same words, right? So the way I find out that you wanted to do this is, if it looks like you both have this exact same words, you know, for for a whole paragraph, then it's very hard for me to believe that you actually understood and then exactly got the whole wording, right? But if the answer, the flavor is the same. Um, so the, if you follow this policy, so if you uh, uh, work with each other for a little bit, go off and do something and then write it down. Uh, naturally, things will kind of deviate a little bit, and that's okay because that's that's what you kind of got out of the system. That's what I want, right? So does that sort of clear the logistics and stuff, right? So. Um, 
So first, let, let's let's you know go through the the textbook, and I'm going to go through the chapters in a uh, different order, you know, four and then and then three. Four talks about color in image and video, and uh, three talks about images and representation and stuff, right? So the, the, the goal of color and all those things is you, we need to understand a little bit about how color and, art and, and, and the corresponding stuff like audio and video and all stuff work because turns out if you want to send a really high quality information to you, right, it's very, very hard, right? And, and, and we'll, we'll, as we move along, you'll notice that it's very, very hard for me to send you all the information that you could possibly see uh, to you because uh, all the information that I could possibly collect to you, right? Because if I want to do that, I need way more bandwidth than what, what we had for the final uh, uh, kind of stuff, right? What we're going to do is we're going to look at, we're going to use all the benefit of all the stuff that is part of the system, right? So we, we, we're going to find out that this particular screen does not actually present all the colors that your eye can see, right? You may, may not be aware of this stuff, but your eye can see a lot better stuff than what can be seen on the screen, right? But you don't usually notice that because your brain kind of compensates for that, right? So if you watch a movie, you're not actually seeing what the same exact color stuff as what you would see if there were actual human beings doing the, the acting. But your, your brain sort of makes it okay, so you don't actually feel, you don't complain that the movie is not as good a quality as it could be. I mean, you may complain, but most people, seem to be okay with that and then they're fine with that, right? We need to understand what are the restrictions of the display of your eye, of your, all, all this stuff, because then we can scientifically make things worse and you won't complain because you, you're not expected to see that, right? You're not expected to because your eye is not capable of seeing that, your display is not capable of showing what, what we are trying to show. And so we need to understand the, the aspects of the human psychology, the human physiology, um, so that we can um, build better, better systems, right? And so the the real stuff on this happens in the you know physiology and um, some other department, right? I'm not computer science, but we need to understand a little bit about how these things work so we can build these systems. So that's the goal of what what this the, this chapter is introducing, right? And along the way, you may find you may learn stuff which is interesting um, and and so on, right? So most of us know that we can really see on the, um, you know, the, the rainbow, right? Um, red to blue, right? You can see the, in terms of the like, um, electromagnetic radiation <coughs> created to some hundred uh, nanometer. And the eye has a bandwidth of over 8.75 megabits per second. That's, that's the bandwidth between the eye and the, and the brain. But there are a lot of restrictions that we may or may not be able to use. Like one of the stuff is, the eye does not see this whole room, right? I mean, you can't possibly see this entire room all the time. So it kind of fills up, fills in enough data, right? So I think I can only see about eight degrees worth of content in full focus. So when I'm looking in this classroom, I'm, if I'm looking at you, all I can see is like, you know, sub about this much of the scene. I can't really see anything over here, but the brain compensates for that because it knows where what things should be, right? So it assumes that people are not Superman. So if I don't watch him, he's not going. He's maybe moving a little bit here, but it's not likely that he would move from here to here in a microscope or something. So I use that to sort of believe that I'm seeing the whole scene, right? Um, and within the way it sees it, it can see black and white. It can see the brightness and the uh, and the lightness, which is the the luminance or, or the black and white aspects, much better than what it can see color, right? Um, and and so you may have noticed it, I, even though you, you won't recognize it, which is at night, and I think it takes like half an hour to move from color vision to black and white vision, right? So if you go into a forest or something, it takes about half an hour for you to start seeing something, but when you're, in, when you're camping and you're in the dark, essentially what you're seeing is all in black and white, right? But it doesn't look like black and white because the eye compensates, because it knows what color the flame should be or what color things should be so you can see something. But you, you can see much better in the dark because you're only seeing black and white. And color only comes in when you are, are in a well-lit area, right? And that is really good because that means that we don't have to show you all the, the, the scene in the full glory of what you can see, but we, we only have to show you something. And we'll, we'll see in the, towards the end of the slides how we use that, right? Essentially, when you see TV, 
you're watching a, a black and white program with a little bit of color added, just enough so that you think it's color, and, and that's it. Right? It's not actually showing all the color you can, you can show. Right? And the color, the, the eye also sees, perceives uh, differences, right? And, and I think the, the, the theory behind that is you notice um, if there's a lot of something, you, know, you don't notice the change as much as a few or something, right? And, and, the, and, the, and what happens is, in our eye, we can see red a lot more. There are a lot more red detectors. Right? There, for every 40 red detectors, there are 20 green detectors, and there's only one blue detector, right? So we can, we can only see very little of blue, but you can notice differences in blue a lot more because it's so little that any difference you notice it a lot more than what you see in other colors. We are mostly sensitive. Uh, the, the, in terms of color, the, the best color you can see is green, right? And, and we'll see what that means because you know, when we do the processing, we, we use that fact. Um, so we can see very little blue, but any glass and blue you notice, we see a lot more red, but our peak sensitivity is towards green, right? Um, and there's also other psychological factors. So if you're taking it, if you're building a camera, to look at people's faces, right? They found out that people seem to like like a sort of reddish tint across cultures, across all the different parts of the world. So cameras purposefully make your face look a little redder than what it is because people seem to prefer that, right? So when you take a when you buy a commercial camera and you take pictures of stuff, it adds a little red tint because people like the stuff, right? Which is good for taking pictures then you have to wonder what happens when you're taking pictures of other stuff. When you take a picture of, of a textbook, it's slightly reddish because it's designed, because it's assumed that it's, it's taking a picture of a human being, right? Um, the other stuff is, you cannot really see high-frequency components. High-frequency components are, are components which have lots of detail, right? So if you, if I can, um, so for, for, for example is, if you want to look at this carpet, right? The carpet has lots of little details, right? So if you look at the carpet uh, anywhere near you, right? It has lots of little details. So I can't really see the carpet in all the glorious detail unless I start to focus and look at any one location. You may, you can, you can find it out yourself, right? So if I look like this, I, I, I only see like a brown carpet, right? If I want to see something, I need to sort of focus and look at, at each area. And what that means is I cannot see high frequency very, very good. And that's the fact that we use for JPEG and MPEG and, and all the compression that we're going to use. Right? Since like, you can't see the high frequency very well, since you, you're, you're able to better see uh, sort of the big picture rather than the small picture, I don't have to, if I want to transmit this wall behind you, right, or this wall here, the wall has all kinds of details. If you look closer to the wall, you see all kinds of little details. But I don't have to transmit those because if, if I had all the bandwidth, I would like to transmit all the stuff, but when I'm talking about the TV that we just saw, and I only have 500, 500 kbps or so, I don't have to show it all the stuff, and the good thing is, since you can't really see it, you won't complain, right? So if you, when, when, after we go through this chapter, you will notice that your TV, the high definition TV that you're seeing, is really awful, I mean, in terms of like the, the, the resolution and stuff, because it's, we're using all the stuff, because if you didn't do all the stuff, we, there's no way we can transmit a uh, high definition uh, kind of TV. Right? And actually, if you if you think about the, the analog TV that we used to have, right, and I think analog TV is supposed to go away in in, in a week or a month, right, uh, month or so, it's really 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 bad, right. So if your your um, your um, VHS tape and stuff, right, VHS tape I think is like 200 lines, so it's it's about like 480 by 200. Uh, image, right? Um, which, in, in computer terms, is probably well, all you're seeing is sort of this much information, right? People are still happy with the TV because we we, we played all those games, but essentially that, that's all you're seeing, right? And, yeah. So the, the two things that, that are very important is you can't see the high frequency. The other thing is you cannot see the um, color as well. Yeah. You say that second bullet point that the eye has a bandwidth of 8.75 megabits per second. How would you measure that? How do you decide? How would a scientist go about and say, I want to know what bandwidth the eye has? What experiment would they do to answer that question? And would it depend on the color and frequency that's being displayed? Would that bandwidth change? That's an excellent question. I don't know what the answer is, right? 
to be okay. to be honest, right? Because all I know is there's a lot of processing happening in eye too. Your eye is not like a camera, right? It's not like like a camera where if you think about the camera, right? There's a CCD or image correction device, which doesn't have too much filtering, doesn't have too much processing. It just basically sends everything to your CPU, right? When you think of a camera, you have this image collection device and then there's the processing device, right? The human eye is not like that. It's not like there's an eye which, has, which does nothing and it sends everything to your brain, right? Your, your eye is part of the brain, right? So there are processing going on within your eye and my belief is it's an estimation, not, not a precise number, right? Um, I've seen the, that, that stuff given as example. So, yeah. It, is it, that it's, something from the textbook? Is it from the textbook? Okay. No, no, it's not from the textbook, but it's from uh, other other books I've seen. Okay. Our, our book, I don't think our book has that. Right? So they give you examples of, so when you talk about megapixels, right, when you buy a camera with megapixels, right, so sort of how far do you want to take it, right? So how much, so you want to know how much is your eyes, the pixel resolution, so it can, you can figure out what it is, right? Uh, what it can see, right? And the answer is very complicated, right? Because I, I think like a 35 millimeter uh, photo, photograph, I think had like 45 megapixel worth of information, right? But most of us find even a one megapixel camera in the right conditions to be acceptable, right? So trying to figure out how much information you can, can you actually see on any one picture is enormously important. I think this is just estimates because unfortunately we can't put um, you know, stuff to measure our, our eye, right? Is it? Uh, those are excellent questions. And, and, and um, unfortunately, all these things come from the human psychology, human physiology kind of folks, right? And I don't think they're interested in the megabits per second information as much as us, because they're looking at eye, right? Um, and it's ongoing stuff because you know they, they have to figure out what what they can do because not just for the entertainment industry but also for military and all those things right they they need to figure out how, how to show information on those things because we're moving to a sort of society where most of the information is coming to you through the eye so if you can understand what the eye is capable of then you can exploit it and and, and make better displays and stuff and um, so the other thing is I can really see and obviously you can really see if it's lit or, or, or there's a um, if, it, if it's illuminated or if, it, if it's glows by itself, right? So this is how the, the graph that the textbook has, which shows how much sensitivity um, the different things are. The D is for the blue, and G is for green, and R is R. So essentially, the x-axis shows the different color or different frequencies, right? And we call this blue, and now I can only see this much of blue, and this much of green, and this much of red. They sort of those together. And the, the dotted line is the brightness component. Right? So we can see brightness far more because of the way the, the thing is uh, set up and, and, the, and the different colors, right? So it all makes sense because essentially what I was not developed for watching videos, right? I, I was developed for you to run away from predators or, or, or what have you. So you need to notice change, right? If, if you see something moving towards you, you need to respond very quickly. So um, for that, you don't necessarily need to know that color as much as you don't need to know whether the thing which is bouncing at you was a lion or just some you know some leaves or something you, you want to be able to react right so it, it places a lot of importance on making getting that right right so any change you notice it very very quickly in terms of uh, moving kind of stuff color and all are added later on in the evolution process so um, and I think they believe that blue is blue came the, the last in terms of evolution so um, I think the first thing to see was red, and then green, and then blue. Uh, so we can only see a little bit of blue, right? The little bit of like tidbits you'll see, we'll see uh, as we move along. Uh, I'll, I'll mention to you as we move along, right? And the other important stuff is each display has its own quirks, right? The reason why we want to know that is, regardless of the system aspect of stuff, if I want, so the goal of let's say uh, media technology is to, I want to take a picture and I want to show it back to you. Right? So that's the ultimate goal. So if you have a camera, I want to take a picture of, the cam of what you see on the camera and I want to show it. So I need to understand A, how human beings see it, B, how the things are captured, how, they, how, they, you know, how the CCD or whatever thing you use to capture works, and C, how the display that you show uh, works, right? And 
that that's the goal and the display stuff varies quite a lot depending on the particular device and you, you might have noticed that right your laptop may have a better display than what you see from the projector and in all of this also differ between stuff that a projector or like a screen and things like printers and stuff printers work in a different fashion than um, what you have for, for displays, right? And we, they need to understand how these things work, right? Our goal is not to understand how these things work. Our goal is to understand how these work so we can figure out how to explain that for, for transmission. So the, the, the two different models is the uh, RGB-based, which you, you, might have, you might have heard from other contexts, and um, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow-based, right? RGB based is you add these colors to come up with the colors that you want. So essentially, you consider the three primary colors as uh, red, green, and blue, right? Corresponding to your how the, the clone works in your eyes, and you create different variants by combining them in a certain different fashion, right? So, so if you look at this sort of a thing, this sort of a graph, right? This is red, this is green, and this is blue. You might notice that this is not doesn't look all that green because of the particular display we have. But in general, it is a red, green, blue. And if you mix all of them in some fashion, you get white. And if you mix red and blue, you get uh, magenta. And if you get, you know, mix red and green, you get yellow. And you get cyan and stuff like that, right? Whereas on the printer, it works by um, deleting the colors because of the, of the way things are printed. So the, the basic colors are yellow and cyan and magenta, right? Again, okay, this is cyan. Okay, yellow, cyan, and then magenta. And when you mix them, you get red, or green, or blue, right? Depending on, on the uh, complementary stuff, right? And you also notice that the brightness goes away much more on this stuff than over here. And you have to worry about how to make these things happen. So if you are, depending on your production stuff, you, know, you want to get your camera and you want to print it to certain things you have to figure out how much of the colors you have to transmit so that people can see what they want, right? So that is a given, so we have no control over that. So we have to figure out how much has to be sent, uh, and they depend on what, what we're trying to do, right? Actually, yeah, the other side they have which actually had the names on it, so um, yeah, so magenta and cyan, if you mix, they become blue. And it only happens if you mix these things in a paint-based system, right? You might have seen this in a few, um, on your TV, there's red, green, and blue dots. If you look closely, you can see those three dots. You get the stuff. But if you take red paint and blue paint and you mix it, you don't get magenta. You get sort of a blackish color, right? So to get paint, you have to have this kind. So if you're painting a wall, you don't buy red and blue, mix it. It doesn't become magenta. It becomes dark, right? So the, the first aspect that we need to know about displays is they don't work very linearly, right? So, uh, what, what this like, graph, graph is trying to show is, what you really want to know is whether the display would show something in a linear fashion, right? Which means that if you have, if you don't give it any signal, or if you give it a signal of zero, you expect it to be black. If you give it a signal of one, you expect it to be white, right, or, or the brightest. And then along the way, you want them to be uniformly linear, right? What that means is if you have a TV and you're controlling the brightness, right, you want that if you set the TV brightness to be 1, point 0.1, you expect it to be one-tenth of what the brightness should be. And if you put it at 2, you expect it to be uh, one twentieth and all those things. But real real life um, monitors don't behave that way. Right? They're, not, they're, not, they're not linear. They act more like here, where for, you know, when you, when you say point 0.2, right, if this is the actual, why is this actually observed? So, so if you had the ideal graph, you have the straight line, which means that if I make it 0.1, you actually see a 0.1, uh, 0.1 here, right? 0.2 means I get a 0.2 kind of stuff. But what you see is something like this, which means that if I give a 0.1, nothing really shows up, right? And 0.2, nothing really shows up. You need to give a lot more. So at the lower level, nothing really happens, right? You might have noticed this on the audio aspects of it, right? So if you have a um, when you're listening to audio player, right? You may notice that if you, you turn the volume a little bit, right? If you if you kind of increase it a little bit, you won't hear anything for a while till, right? 
if you had, if you had, if you if you could control it, you know, in, in terms of numbers, when you put it in, you know, twenty five percent, you don't hear twenty five percent of the volume. You don't hear anything till it you get it up to some some kind of level, right? And that's because of the way these things work. These are mechanical or mechanical devices, so they can't, they they don't act linearly. So what you do is you have to do an operation called gamma correction. This is called gamma, and it depends on the particular display, and you have to do a gamma correction to fix that, right? So that is this 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 uh, other curve on the on the top, which means that if your image that you have only wants to be one tenth of the brightness, right? So if I chose some screen on this on this display, which only has one tenth of the brightness, I would have to boost the performance, right? So this one tenth. I would have to boost the, boost the performance sufficiently, right, to about 0.4 for you to actually see it at 0.1, right? So I take the raw data, depending on the particular display, I would have to boost the boost certain aspects of it so that you see it on the screen. It looks like looks like what you expected, right? On the screen, it looks like you only have one tenth of the brightness. But what I had to do that was to make the image that much more brighter, right? And historically, this was done for the TV. It was done on the camera because in the developing APSC, we didn't have the computing power on the, your TV to do this correction. So when you get a TV program, it's already gamma character, right? What, so what this means for us is there are a lot of stuff. So once you do this processing, there are, we, are, we are boosting certain colors. Um, Sufficiently, right? Such that you you don't get the the, the full ba the color banner that you want, right? Which which basically says that I can't really show you point one. I'm I'm, I'm going to boost it up. So when I, when I come to point four, I have to boost it in a nonlinear fashion. So I may not get the benefits of I may not I can't really show you the real image because I have to work with this display. So I have to boost the lower lower frequencies up. Lower uh, amplitudes of in, enough height, such that when I really come to the the place where I want to be acting, I'm no longer <coughs> doing it in a linear fashion. Right? The the range I, I use is a lot lower than what I could have done to you because of the way the display works. Right? Which is good for us because that means I don't have to send you as much information because you're going to boost this lower level anyway. Right? So I, I don't have to send you the zero to one hundred level. I can send you sort of like in a little compressed level because you're going to boost it up anyway, right? So whatever I'm going to send it to you, for example, a gamma cache of 2.2, you're going to multiply everything by 2.2, right? So rather than sending from 0 to 100, I can send you information from, uh, I forget what the math is, so let's say 0 to 75, but since you're going to multiply by 2.2, right, it's going to look like on, on your screen 0 to 100, right? So that, that really helps me in terms of how much information I have to send, right? So this is the artifact of your particular display. And again, it changes with different displays. So if you had any, uh, depending on your whatever operating system you're running on a computer, you, you, you might have seen the color collection and all those things, which are essentially trying to play with the stuff. But we use that to our advantage uh, because, um, because it's going to the monitors so we don't have to send all the information. Right? I'm going to have to stop here and we'll continue with some of that.